The image of the lecherous nun became popular in the late Middle Ages. But were medieval monasteries genuinely a nest of sin? Let's try to figure it out using the example of England. Until the 13th century, the Catholic Church did not have significant control over the activities of monasteries. Whether monks and nuns frequently fell into sin is not known exactly, there is scarce data about it. In the 13th century, the situation changed. Local bishops began to inspect monasteries regularly, and records of these inspections were kept in church archives. Afterward, reports of sexual misconduct in monasteries became much more numerous. Either the nuns began to sin more, or they started being closely watched. In England, legends of lewdness in convents are connected to Henry VIII and his marriages. As the Pope of Rome refused to annul the marriage of the English king to his first wife, an independent Church of England was established. The Priory of Benedictine Nuns at Sandford was founded in 1110. In the 13th century, the Priory became known as Littlemore, and its fortunes ebbed and flowed. Like other small and obscure houses with limited income, the Priory struggled to survive. The slide into poverty likely caused the Priory's dissolute and licentious behavior. Despite the monastery's long-standing reputation for ill repute, the first visit was not until 1445, when Abbas Alice Wakeley, or Wakelin, was in charge. At the time of the inspector's visit, only seven nuns were living in the convent. To his horror, he found that the nuns ate meat every day, and the dormitory was so dilapidated that the nuns were afraid to sleep in it. The financial situation of the convent was so dire that the nuns slept two to a bed because the abbess had sold most of the furniture. The inspector wrote about the lewd behavior of the abbess and other nuns, condemning the bad reputation that circulates about this place. The interrogation revealed that the nuns often received male guests, the men regularly dined with the abbess, and in some cases, even stayed overnight at the convent. Such visitors included a monk from Rivoli who had studied at Oxford, a relative of the abbess, a master of arts and Oxford scholar, and the parish chaplain from Sandford Borders. Other nuns claimed that the mother superior was lazy and refused to do her share of the work. At the end of the visit, it was decided that secular individuals were forbidden to socialize or speak to the nuns. The nuns were also prohibited from sleeping together, each was to have her own bed and stay in it, alone. The nuns were charged under the threat of damnation and commanded to fast. In 1517, scandalous reports of lewd behavior reached the highest ecclesiastical authorities, prompting Atwater, Bishop of Lincoln, to instruct his commissioner to investigate the situation. The commissioner discovered that the priory was being ruined under the leadership of the scheming, lecherous, and deceitful Catherine Wells, appointed to the position in 1507. Only five nuns lived in the convent. Despite the abbess's threats to remain silent, the nuns revealed under interrogation a number of crimes committed by the abbess over the past eight years. As a result of her financial machinations, the convent was left destitute, and the nuns received neither food, drink, nor wages. She also pawned the convent's silver to raise a dowry for her now deceased daughter, whom she had fathered with a priest from Kent. She also rented out plots of land and pocketed the money. As punishment, the abbess lost her title but was allowed to continue her duties, presumably until a suitable replacement could be found, provided she followed advice and guidance. The situation did not improve, and nine months later, on September 2, 1518, Bishop Atwater arrived at the convent in person and found the priory in an even more deplorable state, with the enmity between the prioress and the sisters even more acute. The prioress continued to allow Hughes to visit the priory and sold wood from the priory lands without permission. One nun fell into sin with a male commissary, another nun frolicked with boys in the priory, and one nun had a child with a married man from Oxford. The nuns, in turn, complained about the abbess's violent temper and accused her of punishing them without cause, perhaps in retaliation for their speaking out against her. No replacement for Mother Superior Littlemore was ever found. Perhaps no one wanted to shoulder such a burden, or perhaps little more was considered already lost. Either way, the priory continued to exist for a few more years. It was not until 1525 that Cardinal Wolsey, needing money for his new school, Cardinal College, Oxford, 
obtained permission to dispose of some decaying monasteries and religious houses. One of these chosen was Littlemore. This was probably to stop the spread of immorality to other monasteries. Abbas received a pension, and the nuns were released from a vocation for which they were clearly unsuited. As former nuns, by decree of the hypocritical Henry VIII, they were forbidden to marry. It is possible that some of these women returned to their families, but it is equally likely that a far worse fate than being a nun awaited them. The question that arises from all the accounts of the convent is, how unusual was the depraved behavior of the nuns and abbesses at Littlemore? Examples of nuns breaking their vows abound. Many of these women entered the nunneries at a young age and not of their own free will. Parents sent their girls into nunneries for financial or moral reasons or even as pawns in power games. Prioresses were powerful figures in medieval England, so having an abbess in the family was a definite bonus. Therefore, it's not surprising that as they grew up, some of them rebelled against the cramped and stifling life to which they had been condemned. Stories of nuns having affairs and children, usually with male priests, often pushed into lifelong celibacy against their natural instincts, are widely represented in literature and folklore. Punishment for such immoral behavior was severe but usually did not result in death. The reclusiveness of nuns and priests became a trope of Gothic literature, but it was hardly, if ever, practiced in Britain. More evidence of the practice is found on the continent. Nuns who had a lover were forgiven if they repented of their sins. More severe measures were also common, with women placed in strict isolation. For example, in 1535, when a Cistercian nun at Asholt Priory in Yorkshire became pregnant, she was sentenced to two years' confinement in one of the women's dormitory rooms. In 1442, at Catesby Priory, the abbess Margaret Waver had an affair with the priest William Taylor. Angry that her immodest act had become public knowledge, she tore off her charges' veils and dragged them by their hair. Six nuns were rescued and told of the situation at Catesby. Apparently, during the bishop's investigation, she beat all the nuns who testified against her and bribed the bishop's clerk to find out what had been said and by whom. Not all cases were isolated. Stories of bad behavior by entire convents of women can be found throughout England during the middle and late medieval periods. In 1351, Cunnington Priory in Somerset was compared to a brothel by the commissioner of the Bishop of Bath and Wells, and the black nuns of Roxel Priory in Warwickshire in the 1320s and 1330s earned notoriety for the Abbess Agnes de Aylesbury's obsession with the priest John de Wharton. According to records, during her reign, the priory fell into serious disorder, with the nuns going wild and refusing to obey her. The situation was not helped by the fact that she lavished her lover with food and gifts. In conclusion, the situation at Littlemore was not the exception, but neither was it the rule. Many convents were respectable institutions where nuns performed their duties with dignity and devotion. At other times, Littlemore might have survived, but the era of female and male convents in England was coming to an end. Worsely, Thomas Cromwell and others used examples like Littlemore to justify first the Reformation and then the abolition of religious houses and the creation, on behalf of Henry VIII, of a new religious order. In the end, the closure of Littlemore was greeted with a sigh of relief rather than regret, 